Okay, let me start with these questions. Is metta an mundane level, on mundane level, that one can think about it and have it? Yes, metta is mundane level. You can think about it, cultivate thought, and you can have it. Can one have metta without removing ill will? Not, not at all. You have to remove ill will at that time when you have metta. Both you cannot have together. Should metta gener uh, uh, generate a universal loving feeling or should one uh, focus metta on a, a specific person? As I said, if you um, focus your mind on specific person, then you would cultivate not real metta but attachment. And therefore, you got to cult develop metta in your mind very deeply and completely charge the mind with metta. And uh, with that space, you can uh, focus on someone. But if you start with somebody and just uh, try to practice metta on that person from the beginning, it won't work. You will, as I said, the, the nearest enemy of metta is uh, greed, attachment, clinging, lust, nearest enemy. Because uh, it uh, is so sweet, you love somebody so passionately. And if you try to cultivate metta to that person, you would not have metta. You really will have a passionate attachment. And yet, it sounds, it's, it, it gives you a feeling of very good feeling for that person. That's not metta. That is the, the nearest, uh, strongest enemy of metta. Because metta is much greater than this uh, attachment or lust. Farthest enemy of metta is uh, ill will, anger. So you can see the enemy coming, but when the enemy is working within, you don't know. It can uh, deceive you. And therefore start with uh, universal loving friendliness and then focus on someone. Eh? What is the correlation of uh, stream entry, anagami, etc., with the attainment of each uh, jhana. Well, each jhana can be used to attain uh, uh, stream entry, once return, uh, never return, uh, and arantut. So there are uh, this, uh, according to Abhidharma, four, five jhanas become forty jhanas. So, uh, uh, f five jhanas become uh, actually twenty, and then its result twenty altogether forty. <coughs> and altogether, I think uh, I don't remember exactly. Uh, twenty. Yes, you have forty. Uh, the other one is, I don't have uh, confusion whether, uh, I'm sorry, confidence whether I actually uh, felt metta or not. This is on Wednesday, the question comes from the same person. Uh, isn't this uh, interesting that I do not know what uh, metta feels like? Is the feeling of metta subjective or objective? Should my metta feeling uh, same as uh, Bhante's? Is there something called metta feeling? When I uh, 
uh, remove uh, dusts, I become mindful. What should I remove to reach at metta? Why am I uh, tearful every time metta like feeling waves in? Does that mean I haven't been removed from sensual desires? I think you gave answers to your question in some places. I don't have confidence whether I actually felt metta or not. But actually, if the metta is not strong enough, you may not have confidence. When it is very strong, you feel confidence that you have metta. Uh, isn't this uh, interesting that, that uh, I do not know what metta feels like? Uh, if you do, do not know what metta feels like, it is difficult to inculcate that feeling in your mind, uh, when you have metta, you at least feel relaxed. You feel that you are a part of all other living beings. You are not special. You feel they are your friends. Do you feel friendliness to somebody? Do you have a friend? I'm asking this gentleman who wrote, just think that you have a friend. I think if you have a friend, you feel that you are friendly. I don't think there can be any human being on earth who doesn't have a friend. If he doesn't have any friend, he would be a real rock. I remember once, uh, uh, a Japanese came to Washington when we were there. He came from Hawaii and uh, he said he didn't have a place to go, he didn't have any money. And uh, then uh, we had a Japanese monk with us. He asked him, uh, uh, how long you have lived there? He said, 30 or 40, 35 years. Then he said, he asked him, you have lived there for 35 years and you don't have a one single friend? Get out. Don't come here. You must be such a mean person not to have one friend for 35 years. <laughs> that was his response. <laughs> so, it is very harsh on, uh, on, on one side, but uh, on the other, he taught him a very good lesson. I, so, you certainly must have, must have a, might have a friend. So, if you have a friend, you, you look at your mind and try to see the feeling, feel the feeling for your friend. That feeling is called friendliness. <laughs> if you have not identified it, that is how you have to identify it. You have a cat. <laughs> you are very friendly to the cat. <laughs> you have a dog. Eh? Sometimes you have pig as your friend. Pe pe people, people domesticate pigs. Uh, Last night you said that self-love is necessary to achieve, to activate before one attains joy. Can you speak uh, on how one attains the necessary levels of self-love in order to bring uh, true joy and happiness into, the, into our lives? It is a necessary level of self-love in order to 
bring true joy and happiness into our daily life. I cannot give you a, a degree in measurement, you know, this, much de- this many degrees of love you must have, this much temperature you have to have, <laughs> and so forth. It is not possible to give you an exact specific uh, degree of love, how much you should cultivate for you to have your daily, uh, make your daily life happy. However, I like to mention that uh, you should start your day every day with uh, living friendly thoughts for yourself and uh, for others and relax your mind, relax your body and start your day's work. And every so often you bring your attention to your living friendly thoughts. When you go to bed that night, Go to bed uh, with the living, friendly thought. Practice metta when you go to bed. Uh, That is also a very effective moment to practice metta because uh, night would be a very peaceful night. In the morning before you, you know, jump out of your bed, you know, as soon as you open your eyes when you are uh, awake, uh, before you get out of your bed, stay in bed, relaxing your body and mind and practicing metta. And if you do morning meditation, also do some metta before you do other kind of meditation. This way you will uh, experience a great deal of uh, uh, relaxed uh, feeling. Uh, you may not get jhanic joy, in these situations, you have to have a kind of joy you, you have in Jhani state is uh, very powerful that would lead to happiness and concentration. I don't think you, do, you want that kind of concentration when you are driving, <laughs> uh, so that you would uh, not be able to do your driving, although you need certain amount of concentration. So loving, friendly thought uh, to be kept in uh, kept alive in your mind all the time, then you will see how effective it is. I can see some people. Um, I think I, I I mentioned here several times in the past. Once uh, I went to um, Poland, and this gentleman was there at that time. <laughs> And the lady who invited me asked me whether I teach uh, metta meditation. I said yes. Then she said, I hate metta. (laughs) 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 So it is so difficult for some people to practice. I know you, I think you know that lady. So sometimes it is difficult uh, if you have not done it. But if you do it very often, uh, you find it very beneficial. You speak about uh, restlessness and worry <laughs> related to uh, unmindful actions in the past. <laughs> I learned a lot of things from these uh, retreat questions, you know, not only this, every retreat. People uh, are very good, they think every possible aspect of <laughs> Something when you say. So this uh, this person asked, uh, uh, what is related to unmindful actions in the past? Is worry about uh, about things in the future uh, because of the because of the past too? Is that why you did not speak about worry regarding the future? You see. <coughs> Uh, it is not because of the past worries you will have future worries. Uh, sometimes that also is possible. You have past worries and that build up and uh, as a habit you might enjoy worrying about the future. <laughs> so um, future worries actually would be 
uh, worrying about how, how am I going to do such and such a work? Uh, would I be successful? How am I going to talk to so and so? If I don't make that, that telephone call, I don't know how that person is going to, what that person is going to think about me. If I don't write that letter right now, I don't know what, I don't know what's going to, what I'm going to cook today, which restaurant I'm going to eat, that kind of things, you know. You can think of millions of such uh, things to worry about the future. They are not, uh, they may have some relationship with the previous worries. Because uh, you know, in the past, if you did not make the telephone call on right, at right moment, at right time to the person, you would uh, get uh, scolding or you would get insulted, you would get uh, reprimanded and so forth. And you may remember that. And you may be worrying now, oh, if I don't make this call to so and so, that person also may react, may scold me, insult me, reprimand me, and so forth. So perhaps the previous uh, worries uh, may have some relationship with the future worries. <laughs> you have to find out all these things. It is endless uh, thing. <clears throat> I have felt that uh, in addition to a point of white light, there are other signs of uh, uh, causing concentration, arousing concentration, such as uh, lighting at the uh, at the mm, feelings, soft feeling maybe uh, feeling of uh, uh, I see a feeling of a cobweb at the nose, uh, as nose and the face, and others. <coughs> Would you please uh, discuss this? Yes, there are certain other signs also, you know. <coughs> Sometimes in order to make things simple and easy for people to uh, practice, I don't mention everything. When I mention everything, people can get uh, confused. Uh, they might wonder which of these signs uh, uh, is suitable for me, uh, which would be more convenient, and so forth and so on. So, in order to avoid a lot of uh, avoid a lot of confusions, I stayed with one sign. Surely there are various other possible uh, signs like cobweb or like a piece of uh, cotton, you know, rubbing on your nose tip. Um, one time I mentioned even like a peg. So somebody sent by mail a peg, big peg by mail, asking me, is it the kind of peg you think about <laughs> that will, you know, push through my nose? <laughs> asking me, uh, you know. Uh, some kind of uh, very fine, uh, sensation in the nasal area, you may be, or even in the forehead. Uh, surely there are some more than one signs. Another question Is PT a physical sensation? Can um, excitement be a part of it? No, excitement cannot be part of PT. It is uh, not physical either. It, it, it eventually spread to the body, but it starts in, uh, in our mind. And uh, as it increases, it will become, uh, it, it will spread all over our body. Then it becomes, primarily it is mental, secondarily it is uh, physical. However, it is not any kind of uh, uh, excitement, like uh, you normally experience excitement. This is 
uh, in meditative situation, everything, especially peace arises, what you call uh, pity or joy or uh, uh, rapture arises as the body and mind become calm and relaxed. And the pity should be <coughs> a very calming uh, mental and physical experience. Because when pity increases, that makes the body and mind more calm, more peaceful, leading to happiness, which is even more peaceful and quiet, tranquilizing. And that leads to concentration. In order to gain concentration, all these have to be very mellow, quietening, uh, peaceful, relaxing, soft, gentle experience. If it is an excitement, none of these things can happen. No concentration, no happiness can arise. Would you please um, address these matters? Bear attention. Bear attention is a very common uh, word used among uh, uh, meditators, especially uh, mindful meditators. I sometimes don't use the word, uh, not sometimes, always, I don't use that word, uh, bear attention. Not I have any, anything against it, but I feel uh, bear attention also has a very uh, sort of uh, uninterested attention, you know. He, he barely touched the subject. You see, he, he barely feels anything. You know, it can be something close to barely. Uh, to avoid that kind of um, unnecessary confusion, <coughs> I prefer using uh, the word uh, pure attention undivided attention, total attention, mindful attention, words like this. Uh, they have very powerful meaning and also uh, a more traditional, more uh, uh, rich meaning. When we say mindful attention, it is not just bare attention. Mindful attention is the is what is called uh, Yoniso Manasikara, the word the Buddha used. Buddha always used very precise words to give the precise meaning, to strike the meaning right into the heart, to drive the meaning, so deep into the heart. And uh, total mind attention, not half and uh, half a cent attention, but complete attention, undivided attention, or I would say pure attention. So uh, that is absolutely necessary for cultivating uh, insight and uh, gaining uh, uh, concentration. Uh, Another part of the question is, uh, that I have asked to speak about is uh, using the breath or, or uh, another uh, subject, object, as Anapana Sati Sutta. In Anapana Sati Sutta, uh, the uh, meditators are advised to use only the breath all through, uh, 16 
you know, stages of breathing divided into four categories called tetrads. Each uh, category has four uh, steps. And it is very profound uh, meditation subject and it has uh, everything that you find in uh, Mahasatipattana Sutta in a very subtle way. Uh, but some uh, meditation, very famous meditation teachers use only that one. That also is a very powerful subject. Uh, Anapana Sati Sutta is, uh, is not another subject other than breath. It is the breath that we use in Anapana Sati Sutta. <coughs> Is there an uh, equivalent in the uh, practice of jhana to what uh, Christian monastics have referred to as the dark night of the soul? <coughs> uh, like uh, John of the Cross. Uh, Dark night of the soul. Um, it is very difficult for me to make any comparison because uh, I have not done that kind of uh, meditation. Um, therefore, very difficult to compare. Probably, there may be some similarities. Uh, which I don't understand. Uh, because once you gain jhana, your <coughs> uh, mind is uh, almost on its own. Uh, Especially in the third and fourth jhanas, you even don't feel the existence of the body. Uh, but the mind is not uh, in a sort of, a, a sort of an abyss. It is very bright, uh, strong, clear, uh, sharp, focused, concentrated. Uh, when we think of any darkness, uh, I, would not, I would not say that there is anything related to darkness. Everything is very bright, very clear. And that's what, um, that, that much I can say, but I cannot uh, give you a sort of a comparison between this and uh, uh, Christian monastic uh, meditative experience. <coughs> Please confirm that when uh, using metta as our primary object, we do not focus on any other specif uh, any anyone specifically but rather impartially and impersonally. <coughs> we begin uh, metta meditation with uh, very, you know, living, lively beings, including ourselves and all other uh, beings. Uh, then we move on to the whole uh, universe. <coughs> and then uh, since, since beings are innumerable, incalculable, all over the universe, we cannot keep a track of them. In that situation, we lose faces of beings. And then the mind becomes uh, so tuned, 
attuned to the metta uh, thought that uh, mind would simply uh, see a uh, see a speck of uh, beings little specks in the space kind of uh, feeling and then when it uh, sinks this words sinks into the thoughts then those uh, even those specks of beings in the universe will disappear then it becomes just a pure mere thought of friendliness and then as the mind becomes calm body becomes calm and relaxed even these uh, thoughts dissolve into feelings and the men in the mind we feel even physically we feel friendly feeling all within us and around us and therefore uh, surely at that point there is no uh, personality no any uh, being it is really impersonal uh, subjective we started with the external world and it eventually becomes a subjective ex- experience <coughs> from that our mind and body becomes even deeper uh, even more deeply relaxed and more deeply calm and peaceful knowing uh, that everything all around us within us everything is secure protected no harm no difficulties no problems everything is going on smoothly this may not happen in reality the world will never become you know without problems without troubles and this is just uh, naive uh, to think the world would never become that way. but the feeling the thought in our mind is that everything is calm why because we do not pay attention to each and every individual countless of beings and problems in the world we cannot do that although we start with all beings and we continually think and cultivate these thoughts in our mind and then that thought in for us becomes a reality within us and we begin to feel that that's all not we um, imagine even for a speck of even for a second that uh, the world is going to be totally free from troubles <coughs> it has never happened it will never happen and buddha knowing this he introduced not introduce he uh, incorporated this practice of metta practice of metta is not something that buddha invented it was all alone in uh, from time immemorial in uh, in the heart of living beings whether they are human or non human uh sometimes you might uh, feel how about uh, tigers lions all predators who that uh, kill other beings and eat do they have metta you may ask even they have the r- root of metta that manifest as the as the as attachment to their own cubs and young ones and that tendency is uh, is uh, sublimated in human mind human mind also has that animal tendency but at the same time they have the other aspect sublimated uh, aspect which we call love or loving friendliness so the root is there all in all living beings
Okay, somebody asks, what is Brahmacharya life? Brahmacharya life is living, uh, abstaining from all sexual activities. It's called Brahmacharya life. So, I don't have to go into details when we say in one word, abstaining from all sexual activities, you can bring the details into your mind. <laughs> okay, another question. <clears throat> Which of your own commentaries is most accessible? Uh, path of serenity and insight is most accessible, and the other is uh, uh, the jhanas, that little book, also is accessible. And the other one, uh, the critical analysis of jhanas, is not uh, uh, accessible. It is in, it it is it is printed. Uh, we got some copies, and it, they disappeared very quickly. Uh, that is the larger book, uh, larger than the pathos, <coughs> serenity and insight. <coughs> uh, regarding the jhanas, these uh, three books I have written on my jhanas, <coughs> and uh, except the first one, the critical analysis of jhanas in Theravada Buddhist meditation, other two are available. Is correspondence or prose okay, or should one confine oneself to journal, uh, journalizing? I think th this was uh, uh, stipulated at the very beginning of the retreat, all you can do is generalizing, nothing else. Now the retreat is over, you go ahead and write anything you want. Listening to tapes and so forth afterward. But during the retreat we got to confine ourselves, restrain ourselves, me, I mean discipline our mind to the, and focus on the practice. Another question. Are you using the Vishuddhi Magga or uh, Sutta Pitaka? Are there more than two that uh, address jhana directly? <coughs> uh, among uh, secondary sources, Vishuddhi Magga is the best that deals with done in the greatest detail. Other secondary resources, commentaries, Madhyaminikaya commentary, Dikhinikaya commentary, wherever the uh, discourses dealing with jhana uh, are explained, are commentated, in those commentaries, <coughs> yes, That is another problem, then therefore I don't have to mention that. <laughs> One more thing you available in English is uh, Vimutti Magga, uh, the, the path of liberation. So uh, the questioner asked me whether I'm using uh, Visuddhi Magga or Sutta Pitaka. My uh, teaching uh, basically based on suttas, discourses. Very little information I uh, find, I get from uh, Vishuddhi Magga. Not I don't have respect for Vishuddhi Magga. Vishuddhi Magga is an enormous amount of, you know, s source uh, of, uh, for, for any meditation practice. <coughs> one would take at least one whole year to study Vishuddhi Magga and uh, master it, and it takes ten years to start the practice. I don't think people can wait that long, because it gives so much details, uh, so we have to 
uh, summarize and bring them to our practice. I may be a little uh, uh, exaggerating regarding the length of time depending on an individual's uh, um, caliber. Uh, some people may grasp it very quickly and practice quickly, I don't know. But for me, it, it, has, it took many, many years to study uh, and to learn what, uh, understand what Vishuddha Mahabhya explains. It's a beautiful, wonderful, good book. Please speak to Kasina practice and uh, breath as concentration device. Is one is superior? I cannot say which is superior, but as far as concentration is concerned, Kasinas are quite good. <coughs> one only uh, disadvantage is it is very cumbersome. It is difficult to uh, be ready, mm -hmm. available anytime we want, and finding a place and so forth. Therefore, Kasina uh, as uh, readily available uh, objects of meditation would be a little inconvenient. <coughs> How are the casinos chosen? Casinos are chosen according to the individual's uh, temperaments, individuals, some individuals like one casino over the other, prefers one over the other. So the person has to decide uh, according to the person's own uh, taste. <coughs> and I would not uh, try to recommend uh, one particular cousin according to people's uh, temperaments and characters and so forth. That's not going to work. You know, <coughs> only the Buddha only the Buddha was able to give a subject of meditation to people according to their temperaments. Not even Venerable Sariputta, the second one to the Buddha, was his one of the two chief disciples. Then monks or meditators do, uh, uh, do healing, do they use their power? Uh, the Tibetan monks are uh, especially known for this. I think some people, whether they are monks or lay people, choose their, uh, their very deep uh, inner mental clarity and warm feeling, friendliness and uh, so forth to heal others. Uh, these days there is one monk even in Sri Lanka. He once came to Washington. He, when he comes to, go, whenever he, wherever he goes, hundreds of people flocks around him to get healed. Just like faith healers in any way. Uh, but normally, <coughs> uh, I must tell you, in the Buddha's teaching, especially in Theravada tradition, monastics are prohibited to do healing, to practice medicine. That is the Theravada tradition. But in Mahayana, there is even one Buddha called Medicine Buddha, Bhaisajya Guru. They even made a Buddha who gives you healing, who, who transmits the healing power to you so that you can use it. <coughs> that is a special... They say it is because of, out of compassion, you must do something for people. So you go out and heal. And uh, in the Theravada tradition, it is prohibited because you are supposed to do selfless service. When you do self uh, medicine and so forth, uh, people will not go away without paying you something. So you eventually ends up, end up as a, 
as doing a profession for money. So you lose all your original purpose and intention. For this reason, uh, I mean, because there's, re there's a possibility of uh, getting corrupted and to avoid that put the prohibited monks to, or nuns to practice medicine. Can they see the future idea of using uh, concentration in the mm, wrong way? Yes. Equally, reading future, reading past, and um, fortune telling, all these things are prohibited. <coughs> I'm trying to rush through all this very quickly, okay? Since fourth jhana is so beneficial, uh, I should... Uh, ah, should its uh, attainment be the focus of practice, or is that uh, setting one's uh, uh, hopes too high? No, actually it is not... Uh, uh, something that you should not uh, strive. You should strive for attaining four jhana. And that's a wonderful attainment, but you don't rush. Have patience. Do it very slowly, one at a time. One at a time. And master it. When you master it, when you have full confidence, full faith, full strength of jhana in your mind, you try the next. And that way, you won't break your neck. You slowly will attain it and uh, enjoy it. Okay, what is the significance of bright light, if any? Uh, waves, clouds, uh, closed simplest solution is passing this is another your for your skill eh? the feeling khanda do uh, feeling khanda do they mean bodily feelings emotional feelings or both when we use the word feeling in, pa in, uh, in English as a translation of Pali word, we mean both emotional as well as sensation. Because in Pali word, there's, in Pali there's only one word, that is um, Vedana. Vedana means that which we feel. Uh, so it, is, it can be emotional, it can be uh, physical. What is the difference between uh, uh, perceptions, uh, cognitions, and uh, uh, mental formations? Uh, perception, uh, mental formations are distinct in that uh, uh, perception is just perceiving it's a superficial, superficial uh, re, re, uh, cognition, cognitive factor, cognitive force of the mind is perception, as I mentioned earlier. In, uh, at, uh, in English, you use the word perception for all kind of jargon of thinking. People say, that is your perception. That means that is the way you think. That the way you understand, that the way you way you, um, you use your uh, way of uh, looking at things and so forth, but that is not the meaning in Pali. Perception means uh, the word. Although we use the per word perception, it simply means cognition or recognition, superficial knowing of the object. Formations are thoughts. Uh, and uh, these are two uh, khandas, two uh, the 
aggregates or the five aggregates. A perception is one aggregate, thoughts are another aggregate. Uh, in fact, somebody also suggested uh, us to have another retreat on the five aggregates, since it is so complicated. Why is one not uh, supposed to talk about one's jhana at the attainments? You know, when we talk about one's own attainment, uh, it may amount to be bragging about one's own success. Uh, it might um, impress others that uh, you are a very good successful meditator and so forth. It is uh, because of boosting your ego. And sometimes when we talk about it, we may not perhaps be able to express our experience exactly as they are. We may sometimes uh, exaggerate and uh, so that we can mislead other people. And also for to be very uh, humble about it, it's best not to discuss these things. And for monastic, it is extremely, especially for highly ordained monastic, it is extremely serious business discussing uh, their spiritual attainments with anybody. Uh, because sometimes mind can even be deceptive. One might not actually know whether, one's, uh, uh, whether one has really attained it or not. So it is very dangerous. Uh, okay, and I don't mean that in a way of uh, bragging, you use the word, but as a way of uh, discussion, learning, and uh, uh, perhaps helping others. In situations where uh, people, uh, meditators, meditators who meditate for a long period of time, uh, they can discuss. That's perfectly all right. <coughs> but uh, what I mean is uh, telling non-meditators about their attainment or jhanas. Could you go into a clear comprehension again and uh, each of its uh, factors? You know, clear comprehension uh, also very vast subject by itself, so I don't think I should spend a lot of time. I can mention only the four by name. Clear comprehension of the purpose, that means why we practice meditation. Why? That's the purpose. We must ask the question. We meditate to cleanse our mind, to overcome grief, sorrow, lamentation, pain and so forth. We meditate to tread the path. We meditate to attain liberation. So this is the purpose. Then second clear comprehension is suitability. We must ask, is this subject suitable for attaining that purpose, that goal? We must ask that question. Third is uh, a clear comprehension of the domain. Domain means the field, the subject. Uh, our domain of meditation is the four foundations of mindfulness, or five aggregates. These are our domains. These are the materials that we use. And a clear comprehension of, this, of the non-delusion is we have to have a, a doubtless, clear vision, understanding of why we do what we do. That is clear comprehension of the non-delusion. <coughs> Would you recommend trying to uh, read jhanas out of the retreat um, during daily sitting, daily sitting morning and evening, or to stay with metta and try jhana at the next retreat? I would uh, uh, suggest, um, I would encourage people to practice metta and practice uh, jhana anytime they like. If you have attained jhana now, during this retreat, when you go home, meditate even for one hour. 
you can attain jhana. And it is wonderful practice. You use your metta as a subject of um, jhana meditation, or you use your, use your breath as a subject of jhana meditation. Don't wait until the next retreat. That is too long, unless you go another, to another retreat just after this, which is which most unlikely that people will do. And therefore, uh, it is good to um, keep up with the, um, with the practice. Can I teach others metta or it should be uh, taught by a qualified teacher? <coughs> I think you can teach metta to anybody as much as you know. For instance, you can teach children. You may not be very highly advanced um, uh, metta teacher, meditation teacher, but you know, you are much better, uh, you know better than children. Sometimes you can teach children <coughs> how to practice metta even more easily because they are, they are so tender, so receptive and easy to teach them metta. I think some children are naturally very kind, very compassionate, very friendly. Since children are they become friendly with anything and anybody very quickly, and therefore it is very easy to teach them metta. Uh, therefore, you can teach, you can start teaching them. Don't wait until you are fully qualified to teach metta. We have um, uh, sat long hours during this retreat. Does jhana require long hours on the cushion? every day. I think that depends on a uh, person's uh, concentration. Some people can gain concentration very quickly if they have done. You know, trying to attain jhana is a test of your previous meditation experience. If you have done meditation in the past, in the previous life, it comes to you naturally, easily, quickly. And therefore, you, some of you might not need to sit long hours. You may get it very quickly. Some others may need little long hours, like here. So uh, that all depends. So I should not. Uh, there are no. There is no any particular cut and dry rules and regulations of with regard to the length of time you sit. Is it? Uh, is it reasonable for a lay person to uh, adopt? this uh, practice and to expect to attain higher jhanas, it is advisable. I don't um, see any reason why lay people should not practice jhana. They all uh, should try. But they all must fulfill the qualification. If you are not uh, you know, qualified, uh, perhaps you yourself may find it difficult. Here is another question. How does practicing jhana help make one a kinder, more compassionate person? Because of the impact of jhana remains in you even after attainment of jhana. Even if, you know, sometimes um, as an uh, unenlightened person you might uh, uh, get upset, uh, lose your temper, irritated and so forth. But you don't keep it. You can immediately, because, the, because of the impact of jhana is still in your mind, it will uh, come to rescue you from your getting carried away with uh, emotions. And therefore, uh, it certainly helps you to deal with your daily emotional situation. It's a wonderful practice. Uh, do it by all means. <coughs> Repeat the instructions for the first jhana. I said uh, you you start with metta, and uh, practice metta for you, until you feel friendly towards yourself. You must feel, you must be friendly to you, and then expand it to your 
parents, teachers, uh, relatives, friends, indifferent persons, hostile persons, and all living beings. And then send your metta to all ten directions. Send your metta to all beings. And then forget the beings. And begin to think of just the concept of metta. And then begin to feel metta in you. That time, if you want to stay with metta, you stay with metta. At that time, your hindrances are suppressed. You feel very calm and peaceful. And then these three initial thoughts arise, in addition to metta, compassion, generosity will arise, and then it remains, these three thoughts remain in you steadily, and then you will have confidence in yourself, in the practice, in the method, in your achievement, confidence, and then you have joy or rapture. When it grows, it becomes, it turns into happiness. Then you will have this tiny little spark of light that represent our luminous mind, as Buddha said, our mind is luminous. This tiny little spark represents the luminous mind. That moment you gain concentration. That is the first jhanic attainment. On the other hand, when you have metta, sufficient metta, and if it is not strong enough to relax your body, relax your mind, to gain jhana, switch on to breath. When you focus mind on the breath, first you will feel the long inhaling, long exhaling, short inhaling, short exhaling, and then you feel the entire breath body, beginning, middle and end of breath, each inhaling and each exhaling. And then you will have a relaxed breath, relaxed body, and then You will have um, sleepiness and drowsiness and so forth, hindrances, and you will learn to overcome these hindrances one by one. Once the hindrances are gone, your body is relaxed, mind is relaxed, initial application of thought arises, and then you have a confidence, having gone through the whole process up to that point, you definitely can see the results. Out of the results arises confidence, and then arises joy, happiness, and concentration. If thoughts arise, <coughs> and uh, uh, you notice them, <coughs> is it correct to drop them and, uh, uh, and uh, refocus on the breath? Yes. <coughs> <coughs> you drop them and refocus on the breath. In the second jhana, how is vipassana practice? How to? Uh, when you have second jhana, you can practice vipassana in two ways. Even the first jhana, you can practice vipassana in two ways. One is you. Uh, reflect upon jhanic factors, and seeing each factor, mm, they are all mentally created, all these jhanic factors, mentally created. <coughs> and that which is mentally created is impermanent, unsatisfactory, and selfless. You see impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, selflessness, so jhanic factors. That's one way. The other way is using that concentration that jhani concentration, whether it is the first, second, third, or fourth, use that concentration to focus the mind on the five aggregates body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness. In these two ways, you can use jhana uh, to practice vipassana. In the fourth jhana, what are the characteristics or signs 
uh, or the three different levels of the three different levels uh, you mean three different level uh, first level second level and superlative level uh, what you call positive comparative superlative degrees of the attainment of these jhanas so uh, the sign of uh, the attainment of the first level of fourth jhana is uh, you feel that it is not actually very um, steady you will lose it just like any other jhana you will lose it and the frequency of loss of the first jhana uh, determines uh, which level you are if it if you lose lose it very frequently very often quickly then you are in the first level as you keep practicing it over and over and over again it becomes strong steady then the duration is longer than the first one then you are in the second level when you repeat it again and again and again and duration is the longest you can stay in that level even for one hour two hours then you are in the third or the highest level of the fourth jhana each jhana you know the level of your attainment in the first level you lose it very quickly second level you can stay a little longer third level you can stay as long as you wish so long as your body sustains you another question uh, what does your uh, citation for the high uh, for the length of mind moments uh, that is uh, a length of mind moment actually you don't find in any discourse any sutta original sutras the length of this length of mind moment uh, is mentioned only in abhidhamma and in Vishuddhi Magga, in, in the commentary, Buddha Gosa's commentary. The, in the, the sutras, we don't, we don't find the length of mind moments. Uh, are the supramundane uh, accomplishments what the uh, mahayanists uh, call siddhi and uh, should they be uh, kept secret supramandan is uh, we don't call it Siddhi. Siddha, Vidyadhara uh, is supernatural attainments, but they are not uh, correspondent, uh, corresponding with the supramundane attainment. Supernatural attainment is one thing, supramundane attainment is another. Supernatural is uh, it simply means it is just beyond natural state. Supramundane is not just supernatural, it is not, it is go, it goes beyond mundane level. Supernatural can be, can be created, it can be uh, like magic. Magic can be supernatural because it is not natural. It's a trick. You can, uh, you know, mesmerize people. Siddhi is like that. But super, uh, um, uh, supramundane 
is uh, uh, we everybody can go beyond mundane level and uh, liberate oneself from all mundane problems greed, hatred and delusion and so forth. By attaining supernatural powers you cannot destroy your defilements. You rather reinforce your defilements when we have supernatural powers. But super mundane powers uh, make you humble and simple and uh, all your defilements will be destroyed. Somebody who has both super mundane attainment and supernatural powers will never abuse supernatural powers. Somebody who has not attained super mundane level and just attained supernatural powers can abuse the powers because that attainment does not destroy defilements. Okay. Could you explain how one uh, uh, contemplates impermanence in fourth jhana without uh, conception? Isn't a visual image uh, a concept? <coughs> In the, I think I, I tried to explain it yesterday and uh, day before a little bit, that uh, when you are in the fourth jhanic level, your concentration is extremely powerful and you have all other mental uh, factors like attention, uh, mindfulness, uh, uh, clear comprehension, and uh, equanimity and all these things and therefore uh, you won't fall into any kind of emotion, any kind of thinking but your attention will di direct the concentration on the body for instance. Body is not a concept, body is not a word. When you, when you focus the mind on the body that concentrated mind can penetrate the body, uh, penetrate into the various aspects of the body and see them ex functioning exactly as they are. And they are not mental images, not words, not concepts, but reality that is going on. The dynamis dynamism or dynamic uh, force of the body you can, with the concentrated mind you can see. And it is, it is not a concept. We go, even a concept is broken into minute uh, parts uh, with this concentrated mind. And it is not just visualizing and all imagination, visualizing, yes, uh, will be seized at that level. I think I got an indication from somebody that we must uh, uh, stop here, and uh, I don't uh, think we should proceed with this for now, and we start tomorrow uh, morning just before closing. When this kind of discussion is over, you may say sadhu sadhu heartily. <laughs>